What does faith look like? When someone exercises faith in God, how is that expressed? Well, God's given us a whole litany of people that walked by faith, that did exploits by faith in Hebrews chapter 11. We're gonna look at some of them. We're gonna ask them to come down from heaven and tell us, hey, what is faith all about? What does faith look like? And you might be surprised because their answers are going to differ somewhat. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is the biblical, technical definition of faith. Faith and hope work together. In fact, faith without hope is hopeless. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Today's English Bible says faith gives substance to our hopes. Faith brings our hopes into tangible reality. You could say hope is it's the goal setter, it's the vision, it's, it's, it's the goal in front of you. Faith makes that a reality. Just recently we were in St. Louis attending the wedding of a friend and Janet and I in the hotel room, and our daughter was actually with us there in the room, and the temperature was a bit uncomfortable. And we couldn't get the air, con air conditioning unit to work properly. It's because the thermostat was damaged. The thermostat wasn't working. The thermostat controlled the air conditioning unit. Well, that thermostat is like your hope. It sets the goal. And once the goal is set, then the air conditioning unit can kick in and make your desire a reality. And so we had to call down and say, hey, look, there's a problem with the thermostat. They came and fixed the thermostat and then the air conditioning unit worked fine. With some of you that are here tonight, the devil has attacked your hope. You've lost your hope of ever having a good marriage. You've lost your hope of ever recovering physically and gaining your strength again. You've lost hope about ever, you know, recovering financially from the hole perhaps that you've dug yourself into. Maybe you've lost hope concerning your children. Well, I'm here to get your hopes up tonight. <clears throat> I've been accused. People say, Bailey, you shouldn't do that. You know, you, you preach about healing and then you get people's hopes up. I plead guilty. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do for your health, your finances, your relationships, your future, because without hope, faith has nothing to give substance to. And you know, both faith and hope come from the Word of God. Let me just quote to you a few verses. Just listen to them. This is from one Psalm, Psalm 119, just to reveal how important the Word of God is in connection with hope. Listen to these verses. Psalm 119, verse 49. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. Verse 81. My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. Verse 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Verse 116. Uphold me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Verse 147, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. And whether it has to do with healing or finances or significance or influence, the word of God will cause your hope to come alive. And hope precedes faith. Hope comes first. And some of you, there's going to be a, a, a flame of hope begin to kindle in your soul tonight. Faith, in turn, faith in God, faith in his promise can turn that into a reality. Now, faith is also produced and sustained from the word of God as well. And you'd be familiar with these verses. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 
talking about the message of Christ, he calls it the word of faith. The message about Christ's redemption, about salvation, about healing, about deliverance, peace, everything that Jesus came to bring us. Paul said this about it. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Same chapter, Romans 10 and 17. I bet you know this one. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from the word, just like hope is born of the word. The Bible says this of Abraham in Romans 4 and 20 from the American Standard Version, that looking onto the promise of God, he wavered not through unbelief, but he waxed strong through faith, giving glory to God. Abraham, looking onto the promise of God, waxed strong or grew strong in faith. As long as he had his eyes upon the word, as long as he kept his eye upon the promise, his faith was encouraged, it was nurtured, it was sustained. The moment we take our eyes off of the word of God, faith can begin to falter. Listen to me. The promises create, they nurture, and they sustain faith. You know, we were on vacation just recently. We took the whole family away. We, we rented a condo from a, an individual, did it online. And all we had was a confirmation letter that it was ours. And we planned, the whole family planned all of our travel, did everything, spent money, got ready, took the time off. Somebody says, how do you know there's even a condo? <laughs> I have a confirmation letter. I have a piece of paper with words on it that is my confirmation, and it's all I need. And we acted on that. Well, friend, I have some words on another piece of paper. It's all the confirmation that I need. The promises of God. It's our title deed. Faith is the title deed, it says. You can own a piece of property that you've never even seen. The proof, the title deed. Faith is the confirmation. Faith is the title deed. It's the proof of things we do not see, the conviction of their reality. Faith perceives as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. And I love the fact that it calls faith an act because faith is an act. It's fact, I believe so strongly in that because the book of James says faith without corresponding actions is dead. Faith is expressed through action. Now, as we progress in this chapter, at the heart of the study, we will find a list of men and women, heroes and heroines of faith, if you would, that distinguished themselves, and they were set above the crowd by faith. And it's interesting, because each of them exercised their faith in a different way, leaving us some brilliant examples of what it means to have faith in God. But before we get to them and look at them, let's go ahead and read verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So by faith we understand, and the word understand means to inwardly perceive that the worlds were framed by God's word. You were not there, I was not there at that Genesis account where God spoke and creation leapt into existence. But we inwardly grasp that and believe that by faith. But there's more to this verse than just that. Notice that it says, the things which are seen were not made out of things which are visible. Everything that exists, everything we can see, touch, and experience physically was created by unseen things. Faith deals with unseen realities. The things we see were brought about by God's word, and in a similar way, faith in God's word is still turning unseen realities into physical fact. Faith gives substance 
to things hoped for. Right, the first person we're going to look at, we find him in verse four, the first example of someone that exercised faith, that distinguished themselves and was set above the crowd and gained witness from God is a man named Abel. Hebrews 11 and verse four. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. That is through this, this action of faith, he's still speaking. He's speaking to us tonight through his faith. And it says that by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. And that phrase, more excellent, just simply means better quality. By Abel, by, by faith, Abel offered a better quality sacrifice, brought a better quality offering or gift to God than his brother Cain. And the quality of his faith was revealed by the quality of his offering. I'd like you to mark your place because we'll be back here to Hebrews 11. And look with me in the book of Genesis chapter 4. We actually have the story of Abel that is referred to here in Hebrews chapter 11. Genesis and the fourth chapter. We want to read it and allow the word of God, the, the original account, to sort of fill in some of the empty places and give us a better idea of what this is all about and, and why Abel received this witness from God. What was it about his faith? Genesis 4, verse 1. <clears throat> now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel, now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Uh, both Cain and Abel brought offerings to God. And I've heard it said many times, read it in books many times, well, God didn't respect, God didn't accept Cain's offering because Cain knew he was supposed to bring an animal sacrifice. And that was the only thing that, 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 that God would accept because his mother and father, Adam and Eve, taught him that it was an animal sacrifice. Well, you know, that, that, that's good and it, it makes some sense, but that's assumption theology. The Bible does not say that. Cain was a tiller of the ground. The most natural thing was for him to bring an offering to God from the fruit of the ground. And if you read your Bible, in Leviticus um, chapter 2, it says that that was not just um, acceptable with God, but it was very pleasing to God to bring an offering of the fruit of the ground, you know, the, the, the vine, the, 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 the grain, whatever it might be. God accepted that, Leviticus 2 and 1, and not just that, he was very pleased with that type of an offering. The difference, and the only difference we find in Scripture, and the only difference declared in the New Testament was the quality of the gift. With Abel, we read this, that Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. The fat means the choicest parts, the richest part, the best part. So when Abel brought his offering from what he did, raising animals, he brought God the first and he gave God his best. But when it comes to Cain's offering, it's nondescript. He just brought an offering. If Cain would have given God the first fruits from the ground, the scripture would have said so, just like Abel. If he would have given God the very best that he had, it would have said so, just like with his brother Abel. 
It may have even just been Cain's leftovers. Abel gave in faith. Cain did not. You see, think about it. To give God our first and our best of all of our income, when we don't know how the month is going to turn out, we don't know how next week is going to turn out. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We don't know what's going to happen with the place that we work. We, we, we don't know what's going to happen. Before I see that, I say, God, you get the first and you get the best. I'm trusting you. It takes faith to do that. But if I wait until all my obligations are paid off, and I wait until I've used my funds and my resources to do everything that I want to do. And then if I have something left over, I say, well, I guess I can give some of this to God. There's no faith in that at all. It's faith when I put God first before I see how things will be. If we were to call Abel down from heaven, to stand before us tonight. Say, Abel, come here. Somebody get a microphone. Give the microphone to Abel. <laughs> Abel's, okay. What? Well, Abel, tell us. What does it mean to have faith in God? Abel says, that's easy. You just give God your first and your best. Well, well Abel, what, what, what about if we give God our leftovers? Well, you, you have to talk to my brother Cain about that. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I lived in the Bay Area, four years old. Still remember the home. We had a huge field behind our house. I remember older boys, would, we'd be out there with, you know, bow and arrows, shooting their arrows out in the field, and... I had a little friend named Lydia that lived across the street. I think Lydia was five. And Lydia and I would go play out in the field together, and we had a fort. Somebody had dug a big pit out there and put some branches over the top, and that was our fort. And we're playing in our fort one day, and Lydia says, Bayless, look what I've got. And out of her little pocket on her dress, she pulls out a big red sucker. And then out of her other pocket, she pulled out a piece of gum little round piece of black chewing gum, and I knew it was licorice, and I've never liked licorice gum. She said, which one do you want? I said, I want the sucker. She said, no, you have to have the gum. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of us are doing with God. You know, King David said in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. Just the other day I was in church here and 93-year-old lady, just faithful as the day is long here at Cottonwood, loves God with all of her heart. She serves in, in, in ministry here. She's a volunteer and I was talking to her, and she had come into some money that she was, had been trusting God for years for, and it didn't look like it was going to happen, and it suddenly happened, a pretty substantial amount. And she said, I have the first tenth of it that I'm given to God. God deserves the first part. He deserves our best, not our leftovers. He deserves the first and best of our time, of our treasure, and of our talent. Are, are, are we a people that just offers God our leftovers when it's not really going to cost us anything? I think God is worthy of more than that. Look back here in the book of Genesis, if you would. Chapter 4, and verse 6, God's conversation with Cain continues. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, 
and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. He said, Cain, look, if you do well, won't you be accepted? That from the, the original language could literally, literally be translated, Cain, if you do your best, that's what the word well means, it means best. If you do your best, like your brother Abel, he's given his first and his best, won't you be accepted? But if you don't offer to me your best, sin is crouching at the door ready to spring, which is literally what that means. In other words, Cain, the fact that you haven't chosen to give me your first and best reveals that your relationship with me and your trust in me leaves something to be desired. Your lukewarm gift reveals your lukewarm heart, and it's the first step in sin gaining an advantage in your life. You know, in addition to giving God our first and our best, being a demonstration of God's importance in our life, there is a blessing tied to honoring God with our faith in this way. Why don't you just look, it'll be up on the screen, and I love this from the Message Bible, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. It says, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst, your wine vats will brim over. To put that up, just leave that up on the screen, but put it at the beginning. I'd like us to read it together. Ready? Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst and your wine vats will brim over. Somebody says, Pastor, I don't have any barns. I'm not a farmer. I don't have any wine vats. I'm not a vintner. Well, you know, the people of that day, their prosperity, their success was measured in their flocks and their herds in the grain they grew, and the fruit they gathered, in the wine that, that, that they made. It was an agrarian society. And without doing any damage whatsoever to the spirit of that verse, you can just transpose it into what represents success and prosperity and blessing in your world and in your life. Honor God with your first and your best and God will cause a surplus to come your way. You know, years ago, we actually were, our, our church was here on Catella Avenue, just down the road here. We had a commercial office building rented out, um, seated 160 people, and we were way out of space back then. People would sit outside, we'd give them umbrellas so they wouldn't get heat stroke or wouldn't get rained on, and they'd be down the hallways. We had multiple services. It was a lot of fun. And we'd been looking for a, a building to lease, a property to buy for so long, and I and I had spent so much time looking at, at buildings and properties. And in fact, I remember one day walking back and forth in my office, holding my head, saying, God, God, deliver me. I had I had buildings on the brain. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I knew Every piece of real estate in every building within a 25-mile radius, I knew who owned, who owned it, what it was zoned, what it was worth, the history of it. I knew more about the local real estate than any 10 realtors put together. <laughs> and God did set my mind free. But I was praying one day, and we had been, you know, doing our best to be good stewards, and we'd saved a, a chunk of money that we were going to use for, you know, buying a property or you're leasing a building. It was not designated as such, but that was our intent. And, and people in the church knew that, that we were looking, you know, to that end, but, but they weren't designated funds, so they didn't have to be used for that. And in prayer one day, I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart, said, I want you to give an offering to a particular ministry. It was a ministry that was changing a lot of lives in that day, a long time ago. And when God gave me the, the figure, it was much larger than I anticipated. It was a good portion of all the money that we had saved, a, a, a huge portion of it. How 
did that story end? Well, you just have to tune in next week if you want to find out. It's actually pretty interesting. And uh, we had some interesting reactions from some of the people in the congregation when that event occurred. Well, obviously, we only talked about Abel. We're going to be talking about Enoch. We'll finish the story, talk a little bit more about Abel, but also we're going to talk about Enoch next time, so you're not going to want to miss it. But I just want to, want to tell you something. You know, you cannot separate your heart from, you know, what you're generous toward. Jesus said where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. And if we called Abel down from heaven and said, Abel, you know, what, what is faith? I think without hesitation, he would say, faith is giving God your first and your best. And I just want to challenge you, encourage you to take a look at your own heart, at your own life. What is it that you're sowing into? What is it that you invest in? Is it the gospel? Is it the kingdom of God? Or is that just sort of an afterthought that, that you might take care of with any leftovers that you might have after you tend to all the things that are really important to you? Friend, putting God first and having faith in Him has to do with supporting His work, not just with our prayers, but with our material support. I pray this has been an encouragement to you. I pray that, that you're, you're thinking. I pray it's created dialogue for you, your family, and your friends. Join us next time. We're going to continue. God bless. I am so excited about my upcoming trip to Europe. We'll be in Germany. We'll be in Switzerland. We will be in the Netherlands, three countries that I absolutely love, and more importantly, that God absolutely loves. If you've never been out to one of our meetings, find out where they are, do all you can to come out. I would love to meet you face to face if at all possible. I just have such a heart uh, for the people living in these places and, and I will have a word, I'll have prayed and be ready to, to share God's word with you. So again, that's Germany, Switzerland and the Netherlands coming up. Very, very much looking forward to being with you. Hope to see you at one of those meetings. You know, I was actually a bit surprised at how many people came to me and told me that this particular message on these lessons I've learned from my journey through the accident that happened to me and, and the really rough times that I went through and that my family went through, it encouraged them. God has been faithful to me. He's no respecter of persons. And you know, it's not just people in our church, but it's people like you and people around the world that we broadcast the message to that need to find hope in Christ. The message is called Lessons from My Journey. Today, Bayless would like to send you a copy of this very powerful and personal message as his way of thanking you for your financial support to the ministry this month. Use the information on the screen or visit the Answers with Bayless Conley website to give your gift. Request your copy of Bayless's message, Lessons from My Journey.